So the next guest on the podcast is Jared Spiewak, um, one of the, I would like to say, technical, geeky, great at automation and all that kind of great stuff. Um, one of the best ones that I've actually seen in person. So um, thank you very much for joining me, Jared. It's a pleasure to have someone with your technical um, know-how on the show. Yeah, I'm happy to be on. I remember you teasing coming out with a podcast uh, quite a few months ago, so I'm happy to finally get a chance to be on it. Yeah, I've, I, I actually was going to do it in April this year, um, and it's one of those things. I was going to do it at the the Brighton, where um, you and I were both speaking at the Jonathan Kickbushes event prior to Brighton SEO, and I went down there with good intentions, but you know what it's like. You go down there, you have a few beers, <laughs> and uh, it doesn't quite work out. And then, you know, four or five months down the line, people are saying, what's happening with that podcast? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, just never. You know what it's like. Just other things come up and uh, stuff like that. But I'm in full flow now. So, um, and it's, uh, yeah, as I say, good to good to have you on and um, talk a bit about what you're up to and, and all the kind of automated stuff that you do and everything else. But just prior to get into anything like that, um, just for anyone who's listening who doesn't know what you do or, or where you're based and, and your background, do you want to just give the audience a quick description of what, what you've been doing in, in recent years? Yeah, sure. So, so my name's Jared Spiewak. As you mentioned, mainly what I do is I run an agency called Blue Dog Media. I'm based out of Manchester, New Hampshire, which if, for anyone that's not from the States, I'm about an hour north of Boston. Whenever I say Manchester, people always think I'm from the UK, which is absolutely not true. And at, at least once a month, I'll have someone reaching out to me being like, oh, I'm visiting the, I'm visiting Manchester, UK. You want to meet up? <laughs> so um, about an hour north of Boston here in the States, mainly, like I said, agency work, uh, local SEO for professional services, mainly law firms, contractors, accountants, that sort of stuff. Aside from the agency, I also dabble a little bit in affiliate, been buying some sites up this year just to kind of explore that area. But my background from starting the agency was started learning about this SEO stuff by myself when I was in high school, uh, kind of put it to the side a little bit, did a year in corporate marketing that terrible, never going to do that again. And then from there, started freelancing SEO a little bit, got picked up by an agency, worked for that agency for just under two years. And while working with them, did various uh, more freelancing, some white label for other agencies, was able to move up within that agency, become their lead SEO strategist. And eventually, as what I was doing was taking more off, I decided, you know, let's actually give this give this stuff a go. And then towards the latter half of 2017, I massively reduced the hours that I was spending with that agency. And then at the end of 2017, right after the first CM SEO or Chiang Mai SEO conference, I left that agency completely. At that point, I was working like, I think like 10 hours a week. So it really wasn't much. And then I just went full swing into what I was doing. And then around towards the end of the first quarter of 2018 was really when I really figured out, okay, you know, this is what we're going to be doing. This is what we're going to be called and all that kind of good stuff. So, you know, obviously you, you've learned the SEO for yourself, but do you come from like a developer background or anything like that? Or is that just something you pick up quite easily along the way? It's just been something I've been able to pick up. Uh, so through school, I, so I've tried taking multiple different languages and I, I took Spanish for like two years. I took German for a couple of years. I tried learning, uh, Russian, Japanese, and all these other languages, and just can't grasp it. But programming languages, I can pick up like nothing. It was really strange to me. So when I was in high school, I, I've always been a big gamer, and I found this game online that actually taught you how to code at a very basic level, just basic syntax. Uh, for anyone that may be familiar, it's just like, what's a for loop? What's a, what's a variable? And all this very basic stuff. It was actually based on Action Script three, I believe, which is in a in Adobe program programming language for Flash, um, and so from there, I I was like, oh, this is really interesting. This is before I really care too much about SEO, so I dabbled in uh, mobile app development a little bit. Never really got into that. A little bit of game development, but when it came to those sort of skill sets, there's a lot of things like graphics and animations and a bunch of other stuff that I didn't know how to do, and I don't have any sort of real skill for. So I really didn't make it very far with that. Then eventually I found out about 
web development, started learning more about HTML, CSS, JavaScript. And JavaScript is the main scripting language that I use. And I just dove into that. Uh, I used, I found this thing called Free Code Camp. And it's basically, you know, it's a free camp learning to code online. And I met a couple people that we, we really encouraged each other to kind of, um, kind of stick through this. I was doing that pretty heavily for about a year. The first business I actually started, at least incorporated officially, was in 2016. I believe 2015 or 2016, I actually started a web development company. And then three months later, I closed it because I was like, there's no way I even to this day, I can't stand doing web development projects for for clients. I just pass it off to other people. It's not something that I enjoy, whatever uh, at any and in any sense of the word, I really prefer it as a as development as a tool to help my business do various other things, as well as being able to work with developers very well, but not as a service itself. Yeah, no, just some of the the reason I'm asking that question is obviously we spoke together at the SEO Butler thing prior to Brighton, and uh, just some of the stuff you were talking about there and. Uh, you know, in terms of the screaming frog thing and all that kind of stuff, and uh, it was really weird that like, it just came across like you were some web, you know, coding genius as well. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, this guy is, you know, you know, what is his background? What you know, is he just some mad coder who enjoys a bit of SEO or whatever? But it's quite interesting that you know you do. SEO and that's your core thing and you you, you learn um, all of that stuff to make your life easier as an SEO which you know that that's even better than I right, thought exactly. <laughs> if you're able to turn, to turn your hand to those skills and I think many of us um, and including myself are not blessed with being able to pick up even you know you're saying there some of the basic stuff you know you were playing a game and uh, and it taught you the the basics and you know you were talking about certain things there that i've never even heard of and so the very basic things for you are probably mind-blowing for someone like me like i'm an old school seo and uh, you know i consider myself to have a broad range of knowledge and i know and understand how it all works and everything else but in terms of coding and stuff it just has always 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 been a, a massive weak point and that's how i've never you know if i want any kind of automation or to make life easier for myself. I've never had the ability um, or brains to be able to do that. So I think it pro- it's probably why you stick out. You know, for, for me, um, on the occasions I have heard you speak, I'm like, bloody hell, this is one smart guy. And I think it certainly does set you above most other SEOs when you hear you talking about all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, we all love automation. We all want to work um, smarter rather than diff, you know harder and and stuff like that and it's great that you're able you know you, you're just you're clearly one of those guys though that can just do that quite easy you know I've spoke to so many SEO guys that you know they, they couldn't even do a bit of HTML it's just that's too hard for them um, so you know I certainly think it's a unique skill in itself that you've got there but what I'd like to know more about um, you know obviously you've got you're doing all this kind of stuff and you're a young guy um but what's what's the sort of things that you're automating what sort of processes are you automating within your day-to-day business so, to give you a very high level anything and everything i'm what i consider efficiently lazy if something takes more than five minutes of my time i try to find a way to automate it now it's not always a practical automation it's not always something that works and i have a trello board dedicated to just things that I do that I need to figure out a way to automate. But that's how my mindset works at a high level is whenever I'm doing something and I think of, you know, there must be a way to do this faster or there, you know, it, I wonder if I can automate this particular part of this process. I write it down. And when I have free time, I actually try to work on it just because, I mean, if, if I can take what normally takes me eight hours and do that within three hours, I mean, I can either do an entire workday in three hours, or I can now have you know a five extra hours to do something that you know, somebody else doing what I was doing wouldn't have the time to do because it would take them eight hours to do that. Uh, so in terms of some of the things that are actually being automated to uh, explain a couple of documents that I've talked about beforehand, and I'll get into a little bit about how someone could kind of get into automation themselves is 
one of one of the main things that I've kind of put out there publicly is my keyword research automation sheet, and it's more of a it's more of a that's more of a fancier word than a keyword research sheet that helps you automate part of the process. It doesn't it's not click a button and our keyword research is done, but basically, at least the public version, there's a newer version that I'll eventually release. Um, the what it does is you export data from places like Ahrefs, Search Console, um, and all these other places. You indicate what pages on the site through just coming up with your own name for it, like homepage, roofing page, uh, plumbing page, whatever it may be. And it helps you sort through that list, organize, parse data, select what keywords you want to target, and then organize that on a per page basis automatically on the other uh, side of that at a very high level. I think it's um, teambluedoc.com slash like keyword dash research or something like that. So it's like one area where basically the pro of that sort of sheet is what a lot of the automations that are, that are that are able to be done on a very basic level is it helps with parsing various amounts of data. Where with Ahrefs, if we export a page that ranks for a thousand keywords, well, if all I have to do is import that into a Google Sheet, then automatically on the back end, if that automatically parses out of, based on certain metrics. So uh, if the keyword has to have a certain amount of search volume, if it has to contain a certain word or a certain string of words, if it has to be a certain uh, keyword difficulty, if that's what you're looking at, just to speed that up massively if you already know what you're going to be doing. Uh, another sheet is something that was uh, that I created when I had to do a disavow file for a client. And basically, they had done some kind of very old school SEO, massive amounts of unrelevant PBNs back in like 2012, 2013 that still exist on their site back in like 2016, 2017. So had to export the link profiles from Ahrefs, Moz, SEMrush, Open Link Profile, uh, Profiler, whichever one is called, and a couple other sources. Now, the issue with this is that there's a lot of duplication and overlap, and I wanted to find where the unique links were. So I just created a sheet that just basically looked at each individual sheet, found where the uh, the data would be for the URLs, where the link was coming from, or where the backlink was from, find all the unique ones from each individual sheet, and just combine that into, into one sheet so I could see, okay, here's all the links that were unique on Ahrefs, here's all the links that were unique on Moz. Again, just data parsing uh, another sheet, and then I'll get into kind of how to someone could actually dive into automation without it being super overwhelming for them uh, is when we were doing secondary citations. So the type of citations you'll probably order from a vendor, you get 50 citations, and then you get a list back of all the citation URLs. Well, the issue was we needed to then check, do these citations, do the links actually exist? Do they link to the correct page that we wanted to link to? What is the anchor text being used? Is it a URL anchor? Is it like visit website? Is it click here? Is it an image? Is it for whatever reason a, a, a keyword anchor? Whatever it may be. And we also wanted to check how many links were on that page. So is this a citation where we just get one link? Do we get three or four links? So uh, just to kind of keep track of all that. So what I noticed was what we needed to do was take this list of URLs and figure out a way to easily uh, figure out all that kind of data. And through a tool called Screaming Frog, which anyone that does SEO is probably familiar with, it that it basically allows us to do that. So what I did was I went into list mode, added all the, let's say, 50 URLs, crawled them because list mode only crawls those individual URLs, and then I exported the all out links. And what that does is that file contains every single link on that page, which goes into like the thousands very easily. So where the automation comes in is then I built a sheet that you just import that link file, you indicate what the client's URL is, and then it parses through that list and finds all the links from that list that link out to the client URL, as well as uh, the anchor text being used. So it was able to automate a lot of that sort of process as well, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, that was that was the one you were speaking about at SEO Butler, was it not? Uh, not one? exactly. So that's part of. So what I was talking about with Adam at Brighton was with Screaming Frog version ten point and this gets into a lot a, something that's way more technical in my opinion is they came out with console commands. 
So if someone isn't familiar, at, at a very basic level, basically your entire computer is run through your uh, command line for lack of a more technical explanation. So if you're on a Mac, you can open up the term, the terminal program. If you're on a Windows, you can open up the command prompt. And so there's a lot of different things you can do in here. Um, people who are familiar with Linux are probably familiar with, with this. Um, but you can you start on like your you, you, your root user, you can do things like uh, go into a specific folder, delete files, uh, create files, a uh, bunch of other fancy stuff. But what you can also do is control various programs. And what Screaming Frog now lets, allows you to do is you can have a string of commands that says crawl this URL using this config config file and export this uh, this sort of file. So what I can do is I can say, well, if I have a specific uh, audit that I'm trying to do for a client, maybe I use a specific uh, configuration file, which you can already save and import uh, on Screaming Frog normally, and then I export certain files. So let's say I export to see if there are any uh, broken th uh, redirects or there are any redirect chains, if there are any issues with the uh, canonical URLs, I want to maybe export the internal HTML tab, and maybe I also want to export any images that are missing alt text. So normally what I would have to do is I would have to open up Screaming Frog, load my configuration file, enter the URL I want to start crawling from, crawl that, wait for that to finish, and then manually go to each report and click export. Now with the terminal, what you're able to do is through what's also called an alias is basically a, a variable, if you will. I can just type two or three characters plus the URL that I want to crawl. And what that allows me to do is even without a GUI or a GUI or graphical user interface, so it just runs the program without any sort of uh, interface with it. It can automatically crawl that completely and export all my files for me with only me having to press a couple buttons and put in the homepage URL. Interesting, interesting. So on the kind of stuff that you just spoke about there, um, if someone's going, bloody hell, that sounds really good. Is that something you share with people? Do you give it away, sell it? You know, how, how does someone get their hands on that? Or can yeah, someone so get I their actually, hands on that I wrote stuff? a guest post for SEO Butler. If you go to, if you can just Google SEO Butler Screaming Frog Automation, you'll be able to find a step-by-step -step walkthrough for both Mac and Windows as to how to get started with that. It's very, all the kind of code, if you will, is copy and paste. Um, and I mean, I'm very accessible generally through Facebook is the easiest way to get in touch with me. Unless you have my email, then email is the easiest way to get in touch with me. Um, so if you have any questions, just let me know. But that'll be a that'll be a very, I try to make it as simple as possible in order to get somebody started. So it should be fairly straightforward. I haven't had anybody reach out to me yet and tell me that they had any major issue. <laughs> um, interesting, interesting. Um, so for people who want to start to do this type of thing for for themselves and start to you know come up with ideas and automate certain things you, you mentioned earlier it's you know there, there's easy ways to do that you know is there something is there a tool or you know how would you suggest people can get into sure. that so i tend to, to find themselves? that automation has a snowball effect and what I mean by that is a lot of the things that I'm automating today or even the methods that I'm using to automate things, I, I didn't even think, I didn't even have a thought of uh, years ago. There was, there are tasks in tasks that we do now that I'll open it up and I'll start working on something and be like, oh, I can, I know how to automate this because I already did this before. And so it does have a bit of a snowball effect. Once you get started with it, you'll, you'll learn more things. And as you learn more things, you'll realize that, oh yeah, on these eight other things, I can apply this logic to that. And then now that I understand this, I can do this, yada, yada, yada. So what I would recommend is for anyone that wants to get started with automation, start with Google Sheets, um, Excel, whatever you're using. I prefer Google Sheets. And look at anything that you're doing that's repetitive and create template folder files if you haven't already. For example, let's say a task that you do is, or maybe have your VA do, is you go to Ahrefs, you enter in the client URL, you export all the backlinks that they have, you then upload that into a Sheets file, and then you then parse that list where you're looking at all the backlinks that are do follow and have a DR of 20 plus. Well, what you're able to do is automate that completely is 
you build essentially what's what I call a helper sheet. And so and you'll get used to some of these equations and whatnot, but you import that spreadsheet into a Google Sheets uh, sheet, and then you create a new sheet. And you try to, without editing the original uploaded file, to get to parse all the data you need automatically. So for doing something like that, you would... Uh, the query function is something that I would recommend everybody be aware of how to use. And you'd be able to do this just with that one function is you'd be able to say, okay, query the entire, the entirety of the import sheet and only pull in the URLs where the DR is 20 plus and the, uh, the follow slash no follow is listed as uh, do follow. So the query functionality would be uh, the easiest way to do that. And that's what I would recommend is just, to figure out if you don't know these functions, just literally Google it. That's what I did before I even knew the query function existed. I just looked at what am I trying to do and I Googled what I'm trying to do and then I found a solution and then I just kind of figured it out from there. So doing any anything with Google Sheets is going to be the easiest one because you don't have to you don't have to script, you don't have to rely on third party software or anything like that. I mean you can use scripts through app scripts, but I wouldn't necessarily go that far yet. And just look at things like even in a more basic form, if you have a VA go in, export folder, um, you, you export a file from, let's say, hrefs, and maybe you only want three individual columns. Well, instead of going through and deleting the extra 20 columns that you don't need, have an import sheet and then have another sheet that just pulls in, just equals the entire column of the one you want. And so all you need to do is instead of your SOP essentially being export this file, upload it, delete these columns until you only have these three left, you just import that file and it already parses all the data for you. So parsing data through spreadsheets would be the first thing that I would recommend people automating because you're going to get used to certain uh, functions such as VLOOKUP, query, um, uh, array formula, which is a good one, if statements, uh, count, depending on what you're doing, and the various forms account, count if, count a, so on and so forth. And those kind of main ones, array formula, VLOOKUP, and query will allow you to automate a lot. And what you're going to be trying to focus on automating is anything that a VA does. And the reason being is that VAs, when you typically give them tasks, you're typically giving them step-by-step SOPs with very little uh, wiggle room. So it's go to Ahrefs, click this button, click that button, export this, when, upload it to here, make these exact changes. Those are going to be the easiest thing for you to automate because computers work in, you know, for a kind of basic explanation, computers work in the same exact logic. You know, do this, then that. So you're able to, that, that's where I would probably focus. Anything that a VA does, anything that's parsing data through spreadsheets, I would spend my time focusing on that before you worry about things like screwing frog automation or app scripts or uh, creating small scripts for other things that you're doing. Interesting. So in terms of, you know, people scaling up their business, you know, loads of people are using VAs for all these kind of tasks. Do do you still use VAs for some things or do you totally automate everything? I, I try to automate as as much as possible. So the way that I look at it, the way that I look at automation is a in a couple different ways. And some of the questions that I get every once in a while when I talk about automation, mostly from people that are uh, starting off where their MRR or monthly recurring revenue is a bit smaller. So there's just, they aren't doing things at a certain scale where automation is kind of required is why do I need to do this? What's the benefit of it? And there's a lot of hesitation. You know, why, you know, if this takes me five minutes, if a VA does that in five minutes, you know, why should I bother to automate that? And so the way that I look at it is in two different ways, why it's beneficial to, you know, not necessarily have these people or to limit how much that they actually need to do. One of which is, let's say that there's a task that you do that takes 10 hours for your VA to complete, and they get paid $5 an hour. So you'll have $50 in cost to complete this task. Now, let's just say to keep the numbers clean that you just double the price for what you are billable to a client. So you have $50 in cost, and you bill the client $100 for this task. Well, if you're able to automate the majority of this task, and you can't always automate things completely. Sometimes you just automate part of the task. Let's say that this now only takes an hour of that VA's time. So now your costs are $5 instead of $50. Well, there's a lot of wiggle room with this now. You can 
have $5 in cost and still bill the client at what it used to cost you $100. So now you're way, making way more money. You can have a much higher profit margin while still being able to deliver the same exact quality of work. Another option is to be able to do more with the budget that a client gave you, because let's say you stay, stick with that times two. Now what used to be billable at $100 to the client is now billable at $10 to the client if you still double it, which means you now have an extra $90 in billable expenses to do more with their campaign, which this can be really helpful for local SEO where you're usually running with lower budgets and where any kind of advantage in that range can help you quite a bit. So, and then the alternative is also to do a mix of things. So maybe you take that task that used to be built about a hundred and used to have a cost of 50. Well, now you have a cost of five and maybe you bill at 50 and you take part of that and you increase your margin a little bit. And you also increase the amount of work that you're able to do for a client a little bit. Because if you're, if you're, let's say, you know, just to say arbitrarily, if you're able to give a client 100, worth, 100 points, quote unquote, worth of SEO per month and all your competitors are able to do about the same, well, if you automate enough and then you're able to do 150 points, quote unquote, worth of SEO where your competitors only do able to do 100 within the same budget, you're going to have a much easier time and a much more consistent time being able to get better, faster, stronger results with the same amount of budget and money compared to what other people are able to do. So that's one of the ways that I, that I like to explain the benefits of, of automation and even if you're able to easily pass things off to a VA. Now, the other side of things is that when you pass things off to somebody, you're just mitigating time. If something takes you if something takes 20 hours to do, you pass that over to a VA, that still takes 20 hours. It's just that it doesn't take you 20 hours. So eventually you're going to get you're going to fill your own time up. That VA is going to get their time filled up and you're going to have to hire another person. That means you have even more overhead, which means you have to be able to maintain more clients. You're going to have more expenses um, and all that kind of stuff that goes around with scaling a business. So I don't know about you know, each individual listener, but personally, I would much rather have a an agency that does 50000 in monthly recurring revenue with one employee and one VA than 50000 in monthly recurring revenue with five employees and 10 VAs. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one thing I do want to ask you, though, is you mentioned earlier that you know, one of the options um, by using automation means that you can give the client more value for their money. Surely there has to be a line drawn there at some point where you don't want to offer them too much value for their money because they want you want them to keep paying. You know, what, what, what's your kind of thought on that? Because I think anyone, obviously doing it your way is very smart and it gives you the ability and it's not really costing you as such. Um but do you never feel like you don't want to give the client, say, what would be the equivalent of a thousand pounds worth of SEO work if you had to do it manually? Um, because they're going to expect that on a regular, ongoing basis. And because you've been able to work smarter, should you be penalised in the pocket for that? Um, you know, that? That's the way I would think about it. You know, where, where does the line stop? Because Obviously, your your job is to do the best job possible for your client, and if you can spend there a hundred pound doing a thousand pound worth of work, comp- you know, comparing with other agencies, um, you know, when do when do you stop? You know, at, at what point of that do you stop and say? I wouldn't necessarily say you ever get to that point because there there's always a next step with a client if. If let's say what normally takes somebody six months to achieve, you're able to consistently do in half the time or three months, that doesn't, I mean, the, the agreement with the client shouldn't end assuming that you're, you know, you're working with clients that are able to scale their own businesses and they don't have to cut things off because they're too busy or anything like that. So it's just a matter of, okay, you know, here we went after these cities that are really important to you now we were able to achieve the result we want okay well now what's the next level do we start working on additional pages how can we discover additional keywords can we go into more locations can we try an arbitrage strategy maybe we set up one or two more websites for you and we try to also rank those you can also be within the 
uh, serves for multiple positions, um, and so on. I wouldn't necess- I wouldn't say that there is necessarily a cutoff where I would go. You know, I'm giving the client too much because, at least personally, my, my focus is always on being able to give them as as much as possible with, with within reason, uh, and that's what I spend a lot of my time doing is trying to Im- improve the services that we're offering in order to get better, faster, stronger results and all that kind of good stuff. I would say that there's probably a point where if you're doing where you're, if you're a hundred percent putting all your savings into just doing more for the client, I would make sure that your profit margin is where it needs to be. Um, I mean, if, if you, what used to cost you $500 now only costs you a hundred dollars, but you're still doing $500 in billable expenses to the client because you're just doing so much more, I would maybe take a step back and go, okay, well, it, you know, if we're, what if we have $300 in billable expenses, because this used to be what this would have cost us $600 beforehand, which we couldn't have done before. And now we're able to make more profit margins and we're able to, um, you know, do more for the client as well. I don't know if that answer, answer your question well enough or not. Well, makes sense. I was just curious to get your, your personal viewpoint on it because, um, you know, everyone's different and they think about things in a different way. But no, I think you're tackling that in, in quite a smart way. Um, the next thing I, w- I, w- I was going to ask you was, you're doing this kind of stuff for clients and you've got this real smart way of working um, <coughs> that's obviously very scalable. Do you do a bit of lead gen or, or whatever yourself on top of the yeah, client sure. stuff? Yeah, sure. So I just want to um, simply just focus say something on, the clients? on the previous question real quick. Is that well, one of the things that when it comes to kind of, um, I guess, outpacing the client at will is one of the things that I also try to make sure that we're doing from a strategy perspective is day before the client even signs on, I generally have a list of other things that we can do for them as the campaign moves on. So for example, I already know more services, more areas that we can go into later on. Um, and I would recommend anyone else kind of do that as well. You should always be thinking about, okay, what happens after we achieve this goal? What's the next step? Um, but to your question is not, not really. So I mentioned earlier, I think that doing a little bit uh, on the affiliate side of things, just buying up some sites. I started one site, but I've mostly just been buying sites. Haven't really had too much of a chance to dive into that too much. So my main focus is the agency, just because I don't want to, um, you know, not be able to, not cannibalize my own time, if you will, by focusing on too many areas. So it, it's more of there. There are weekend projects where you know working on a the PPL site or some of the affiliate sites, but my primary focus is the the agency side of things and in terms of your agency obviously you've got the smart way of working like how many actual staff sure so including vas are you actually let me working see with? here i have a designer which is really only for if if we need to make changes to like a client site and we just need something to be looked a little bit differently to match what we're doing for seo um i have a a webmaster who helps me with any like cloning sites, moving sites from staging to development or implementing any changes that we need to do from a development perspective on the client site. Um, we, this year we started offering uh, Google ads or PPC services. So I have a landing page designer who's just there whenever we need landing pages created. Let's see. Feels though I'm almost definitely forgetting about, someone which i apologize for in in advance quite greatly um (laughs) yeah i mean that's mainly what's going on i i have great relationships with uh, various people in our industries for being able to use um vendor services for various things that just makes a lot more logical sense uh whether it's um you know getting certain things audited or taken care of whatever whether it's you know these guys are much more skilled at um, page speed optimization or you know these guys are really great at um, you know like citations isn't something that we do in-house um, I do have a citation person actually who's um, who mainly does citation audits um, and then creates the primary citation but any secondary citations that isn't done in-house but my kind of my goals with the automation stuff is to keep the uh, people as limited as possible while being able to do as much as possible. And it's kind of a game for me to see Mm -hmm. just how 
big things can grow with as few people as possible. I think I'd be really interested to see if I could, let's say, have one in-house person plus myself and if we'd be able to hit you know a million a year with that if that would be realistic based on the kind of stuff that we're doing or not like to me like that that's a game and that's that's i mean i love problem solving so that would be really interesting to me even if we can't achieve it it's kind of one of those like well if if we did this this would be um you know quite amazing so just how far can we push it yeah i think it's uh, a smart move as you see there's a lot of different vendors out there who are just really good at what they do, whether it's a link vendor or site speed guy or whatever, you know, and it's something that I personally do a lot of is use different people for different things. And, you know, I don't particularly want to go and learn how to do outreach and use pitch box and all that kind of stuff. So there's vendors for that, that, that you know, deliver good quality um, outreach there and, and, and so on. And I, I think pretty much what is, going on in our industry is 95% of everything can be outsourced if you had to. So I think it'd be a great story if you could have yourself and say one other guy um, and turning over a million, I think it definitely is achievable when, you know, the way technology automation and outsourcing and all that kind of stuff, there's certainly no real reason. I don't see there being any reason why you can't hit those figures quite easily um obviously it's client management and everything else that would potentially stick a spanner in the works for that but um you know that that's down to being able to pick and choose the right clients as well i think um that that would be the only real problem i think you would have is potentially as two guys enough to be able to manage that whole you know bunch of clients um i think if you're charging the right prices of course um that can be done but again you could even outsource the client management side of things as well i'm sure there's somebody out there that is just really good at talking the talk and, and just allow you to crack on and um do do what you do best um which is obviously ranking sites and automating automating stuff but it would be Certainly a, a great story if you were to make that, um, you know, uh, achievable. And I think, as I say, there's no reason why you can't other than clients derailing that. Um, um, sadly, you can't really, some some clients you have to hold their hands, or certainly here in the UK, they need handheld and, you know, yeah. there is, you know, sometimes you go on and you think it's going to be a five minute call and it ends up an hour and 10 minutes and, you know, so there's a lot of things that are out with your control in terms of time management there. But <laughs> I mean, unless you've got some cool way of automating that, I'd be I'd love. I mean, to there are that, some things that we have I'm in place sure that have. I'm asking helped for the impulse with client management. With so for me, like I'm very quick to fire clients that become a pain when it comes to communication, and if they're if they're the roadblock, if they take up too much of my time, where it's like you know, if, if I have to be constantly in meetings with you, if I have to. You know, can't hold you if you're constantly having problems that aren't real problems. I'm very quick to be like, you know, this is just isn't a good fit because I don't have the time to deal with you. I would rather have, you know, two, I'd rather, you know, have two clients at half the budget that you have that are easier to handle than someone that's going to take up so much of my time just because I, you know, I, I'm not there to, you know, handhold them, I guess, as, as mean as that might see, I have I have other things that I need to do in order to be able to kind of run my business. So I'm very quick in, in that kind of frame of things to get rid of people that um, quite frankly, just take up too much of my time. But so when it comes to account management, some of the things that I've done is, uh, so when we take on clients, we don't just jump into retainers. And so our process is that we have a standalone one-time offer that you know, no kind of commitment is just we go in we figure out what their goals are we figure out what the issues are we we audit their site we create a strategy around it we figure out what kind of ROI they could they could potentially make what kind of challenges we expect to face with this what they're going to really need as a budget in order to achieve what they want to do compared to what they want to have as a budget and all that kind of good stuff and so from there that's fairly um standardized in terms of what we do because we work with mainly just service-based businesses where everything is kind of built around there so it works very well for them and so a lot of the kind of account management stuff for that entire process is pretty much automated in the sense that every email that we send we don't have 
kind of like canned responses in Gmail just because those you still have to edit a decent amount. But what I do is I use just basic HTML, CSS, and I think um, jQuery, which is just, it's a little bit faster and easier to write than uh, JavaScript for some of the stuff, which it actually may be JavaScript now that I'm thinking about it. But anyways, basically what I do is let's say we finish keyword research. I go to our keywordresearch.html email template I enter a client name as well as the link to the Google Sheets document. I press a button and what does it, it out put the subject line for me and all the information that the client needs to know that would go into the email as well as a link to the file. I just copy and paste that into Gmail. And then eventually I'll probably um, just have a one button click to actually email them because I know that functionality exists. I just need to look into kind of the dependencies and if that breaks, how, how it's going to look to a client and everything like that. But so for a lot of a lot of the tasks that we complete that are just you know, normal tasks that we do is just there's an email file, just enter a client name, link to a file if I need to. So for example, like content, we have a approval process for content. They have seven days to approve it. They, we don't hear back from it's automatically approved just so that client isn't a roadblock. And so what I have is just a calendar that pops up within that HTML uh, sheet, which is just natively built in. I think it's native within HTML or JavaScript. I don't think I had to build that. I think it was just, I just put in like a line of code and it was there. But basically I click that and it has a calendar that pops up and it's automatically attached to today. So I just drop the cursor down one day because that's a week out. And then, you know, I complete that and it basically says, hey, Bob, we just finished writing four new pieces of content for you. You can find them in this folder. Please approve them by this date. If we don't hear back from you, then we're really going to consider them automatically approved. If you need more time to be able to review these, please let us know that we so that we know not to publish them too early. Thanks. Automatically already created, copy and paste that. For reporting, we use Data Studio. So they automatically get this pretty long email that goes through you know, how, how exactly what all their reports means, what everything looks like, so on and so forth. Um, so that's part of that helps a lot with cutting down on the time because like I don't have to craft emails or stuff like that for anything that's that we're consistently doing. I can just kind of pump that out really easily. It's something that VA could honestly do for account management at that point. And for other things, I think I think it's just a matter of setting expectations to kind of automate them not having to ask certain questions. So what I try to do is I, I don't have a good name for this, but I call it the, you know, the once and done, if you if you will, meaning that any issue that comes up during a campaign, I want to make sure that that issue never comes up again. So if a client it has an issue where they Googled something themselves and they themselves and they didn't like how it looked, I want to either write a piece of content that already answers that question for them so that the next time it's asked, I can just send it to them. Or I want to have a video that I send them during some point during the campaign early on or into an expectations doc that already answers that question for them. So they never even have to ask it in the first place. And that's how I personally try to um, keep account management to an absolute minimum. I think, I mean, right now, I would say there's only two clients that are ever really emailing me that need something because um, everything else is just handled for them. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, one thing I do want to ask you is obviously you're a young guy Um and you seem to have a very wise head in your shoulders. You know, it took me a long time, you know, a couple of bankrupt businesses and stuff to find out how to deal with clients properly and, you know, all of this kind of stupid stuff and, and you know, just to get waking myself up. You know, who who, who, who or where or who inspired you to think like this? You know, you, you just born to think like that logically or is there someone who mentored you to iron out a lot of these kinks in your business because as I say for such a young a young guy um you know you're you're doing things in a very very smart way and I'm just curious to know if there was um, a mentor behind that not or someone you really so follow or whatever I kind of started online when I was I was 14 I was in high school at the time and I think a lot of the mindset behind like automation and finding ways to do things easier it's just that I'm, I'm big into gaming I, I mean I've been gaming since I was like eight constantly just when when I'm done working for the day I go and I play Xbox for like three four hours if not more like um that kind of like very very into that and throughout my entire life and I I think a lot of what I do just kind of goes back to that which is that you know when you when you play games you need to be able to solve problems and you know there you know there 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 are glitches that you want to find there are speed runs that you want to do so you want to try to like do something as fast as possible and 
and all this various stuff. There are new methods that you want to discover. There are um, really difficult challenges that you want to do. And I think it just gives you a problem solving mindset. So a lot of this, so I think a lot of that is just like, I'm kind of just wired to quickly realize here's a problem. Now I want to just find a easy solution. I think the the drive behind it is just, you know, just circumstance. I've always just kind of always been driven to, um, you know, solve problems, go out, fix things on my own, do things um, by myself. It, it really, it really to my core bothers me when I know that there's a problem and that a solution isn't created, which I, which is why I don't think I'm a very good um, employee is because when I work for companies and I see that there's a problem, I very much so want that to be fixed. And it bothers me a lot um, when, when that problem isn't fixed, especially when the solution is very easy. So uh, I, again, I don't know that was necessarily the, the best answer. I think it's really just who I am. No, it's less, it's, it's just interesting, um, you know, that, that, that you are wired up that way. And I think probably because you're wired up that way, you've adapted to this type of business very well because it is pretty much problem solving in a lot of cases. And, uh, and you know, maybe with a bit of the gaming background and everything else, it's just been a perfect match for someone because, um, you know, I... I'm not, I mean, I like playing games and stuff, but, you know, a lot of the mistakes and experience I've got is learning hard, the hard way, you know, and doing all the hard work and stressing myself out and doing everything manually and wasn't able to scale my agency up, you know, the, the way, the clever way that you are doing it. So, um, you know, I felt the pain on the other way. Um, and as I say, just curious to see, you know, how such a young chap, can think like that but um yeah some, sometimes you're just born to to do stuff and um and you know it seems to be a perfect fit and you obviously do very well and and stuff like that on on a final yes, note I am. um you do are you going to Chiang Mai this year um how do you do, do you find that there's a lot of value um networking and, and you know because I know for a lot of young guys um, they're introverts and they don't like networking as much and stuff like that. Um, you know, but I've seen you at, at Chiang Mai last year and um, at Brighton SEO this year and stuff like that. You seem to embrace that side of things as well. Do you feel that that's still an important I think part the networking of your day to day is know, everything. When I when I think about various events to go to, I don't I don't think about. I don't really think about who's speaking or the topic of the event. I more so think about who's going to be there. So, and, the, and so as, as someone like I'm very introverted myself, but I can't like, I'm never one to go up to someone and start a conversation. But if someone does come up to me, I have no problem having that conversation. And so one of the things that was really good for me last year is because I spoke um, at one of the, uh, the workshop events in Chiang Mai is that, a lot of people that were very familiar with me and I constantly had people coming up with me, which to me, which made networking for me very easily easy. Cause I didn't really have to kind of go out of my way to uh, kind of just introduce myself to someone. Cause that just not me to do so. Um, but I mean, the networking last year for me was um, mon uh, monumental because there are so many people that um, once you get to know them in person, there, there are things that they'll tell you that they don't, they don't speak out about. There are people, there are tons of people that know a lot of stuff that never write a blog post that never put out a video on YouTube because they just, you know, they do this stuff, but they're not afraid to kind of share it with you um, through, you know, through in person. There's also a lot of people with various skill sets that you meet. I met someone who was very well versed in the, uh, the web security sector. And this, this year I got my, my personal site was hacked in with a very kind of a sophisticated um, means. And so I was able to contact this person. I was like, Hey, like, I know, I know that you're really good at this. Can you help me solve this problem? Um, yeah, I, there are various other people that I, I'm very good at referring people to other people. And so when I know what people are good at, I'm like, Hey, you know, Mr. Client here, here's somebody that I know that does that or, Oh, this person has a problem I'll refer them there. I'm kind of back and forth. And as well as like, even stuff like this, I mean, knowing people to get on their, get on their, get on their podcast, be able to write a guest post for them. All that kind of stuff really helps. And the, the networking is what really um, kind of makes the events worth going to. I mean, not that I would say, you know, like don't go to the actual conference itself, but I mean, the networking is where I think that you're going to get probably the, the 80 out of the 80, 20. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I would agree with you 
on that. Um, although Shang Mai does have some good speakers as well, um, so I'm sure if anyone listening wants to go to a conference, Shang Mai is one of the the better ones that are out there. And um, I've, sadly, I'm not going to make it this year. I've got another speaking event a week later over in India, so I'm not able to to make it, and I just can't be asked doing the the whole travelling thing back and forward, you know, halfway across the world. So um, I've just spent a month in the US, so um, it's going to take me a few weeks to recover from that, and then I'm back out doing that. But, yeah, I'm gutted to be missing Chiang Mai. It's uh, one of my, my favourite ones, and, and a lot of my friends and colleagues, guys that I deal with and, and vendors and all that kind of stuff will all be there. So I'm going to have massive uh, FOMO. Um when you guys all set out to, to go over there um, over the next couple of weeks. But uh, that is us, sadly, out of time, Jared. But I think you've offered a lot of value um, there and, uh, you know, a lot of tips and, and, you know, insight knowledge as to how you work, how you're wired up. Um, but for anyone who is looking to maybe reach out to you, sure. talk so to you, bounce ideas off you or whatever it may be, um, where's the best place for people to find you? There's an email list on there that I barely ever use, but contact form emails me and then you'll have my email, which you can just shoot me off an email whenever. Teambluedog.com is the agency site. Content gets put up there as well, um, a little bit more consistently. So it's if you want to join a list to hear from me more often, probably join that one. And then Facebook, pretty easy to get a t- in touch with me with, on Facebook um, won't probably get to your message right away, but I do kind of check through that. I'm really not on social media aside from Facebook and then recently started a YouTube channel, which I'll hopefully get a couple more videos on there eventually. But yeah, so either emailing me just or Facebook is really the easiest way. No worries. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. Jared, thank you very much. And I hope you have a good trip in Chiang Mai. 